Right. Um. Good afternoon. Sorry. Uh, okay. Just give me a thumbs up if you can hear me and see me. I, I'm not sure if I'm online now or not. All right. Okay. Welcome to session two, um, which is all about plant physiology and plant biochemistry. I'm not going to waste any time, and we can go to our first speaker, which is um, A. Arantuli. And he will be talking into exogenous application of antioxidants on age, cabbage, and lettuce. Okay, over to you, Arumela. Thank you very much. I hope you can hear me. Can you hear me, please? Um, I don't know if you can hear me, uh, but I'm not hearing any. Yeah, we can hear oh, you. Arimola, we can hear okay. you. You can proceed. All right. Well, thank you very much. My name is Adimola Emmanuel Adetunji, and I'll be presenting on the effect of exogenous application of five antioxidants on vigor, viability, oxidative metabolism, and germination enzymes in eight cabbage and lettuce seeds. <clears throat> I'll be guided by speed outline in my presentation. So we are going to take the introduction. Seed as a genetic resource may be considered as the insurance system for the world's food schemes. The depletion of this resource exposes the schemes to a higher risk, which could ultimately lead to catastrophic failure. The demand for food security for uh, the increasing global human population remains very high. Uh, it's estimated that by the year 2050, uh, there will be about uh, 2 billion, 2 to 3 billion um, increase in human population. And then we also face with the disproportionate crop production due to various factors, including seed aging. It is known that at physiological maturity, uh, seed germination and vigor are usually at the maximum level. However, seeds and that includes those that are classified as uh, orthodox, do not retain their initial quality over an extended storage period, during which they begin to age. And that means that they deteriorate gradually and proceeding inevitably towards death. Such physiological deterioration of seed in storage is mainly influenced by the seed biology and uh, storage conditions for instance, the moisture level, relative humidity, um, uh, the temperature at which the seeds are stored, and the uh, storage duration. Aging induces several modifications causing loss of intrinsic uh, physiological quality traits. For instance, uh, germination capacity, uh, vigor, and stand establishment. And the decline in seed quality in storage has been attributed to the generation of reactive oxygen species. In figure one, the increase, please let me try and find my, uh, let me see if I can find my, my pointer. Okay, thank you. So increased production or generation of reactive oxygen species will cause an uh, imbalance in the reactive oxygen species being accumulated and the antioxidant protection against them. And this will cause uh, oxidative stress which brings about tissue damage by releasing pro-oxidant capable of causing uh, major uh, a modification of major, major biomolecules. You can have a lipid peroxidation. You can have a degeneration of or degradation of defense antioxidants. You can have protein oxidation and DNA damage in plant tissues. There is currently no known method of completely preventing aging and as such in fact not even cryo storage can completely stop seeds from aging even though it may extend the shelf life so without a systematic approach for seed genetic um, and physiological quality conservation achieving the much desired increased uh, productivity and more resilience in the face of the rising world population and climate change uh, will be um, probably an impossible task. However, there are reports that some of the effects of aging 
that is see deterioration may be reversed to some extent by uh, various pre-addition uh, treatments which are able to restore lost viability and ego. And such precision treatments as uh, are, are what we are going to, to be presenting on, that is exogenous antioxidants. And then we have other examples like inorganic source solutions and some uh, biostimulants. So the aim of this study was to investigate the effect of uh, exogenous application of antioxidants, the following antioxidants, ascorbic acid, gallic acid, glutathione reduced, trulot and glycerol on aging induced physical and biochemical lesions in cavity and let you see. Um, such treatments have been reported to enhance seedling emergence percentage and speed of emergence, vigor, biomass accumulation, leaf photosynthetic efficiency in different plants like some sunflower, wheat, and so on. And other promotive or beneficial effects of this treatment include uh, increased starch hydrolysing enzymes like um, aphamylase activity, uh, high soluble sugar level, increased seed yield, improved morphological attributes, and grains of yield that have been subjected to different types of uh, stress. For glycerol, it is a known radio protectant. I think it's important that I mentioned this. It is a known radio protectant, and it has been suggested to have a similar effect, you know, to, or to act in a similar fashion to the antioxidants. So, for instance, it's been reported to be able to scavenge or reduce the formation of harmful oxidants in seeds, embryonic acid that were exposed to desiccation and ultra low temperature stress. That work was done by Session et al. in 2012. It is also known that this glycerol uh, could maintain cellular stability under abiotic stress, to increase cellular viscosity in dehydrating CTUs and enhance plant growth in several species. So to the methods, commercial seeds of brassica oleracea as cabbage and latuca sativa, that is lettuce, uh, were obtained from McDonald's seeds at Peter Marysburg here in South Africa and were used for the study. For sake of time, I won't dwell so much on the methods. However, I'll just highlight some things that I consider important. However, if there be questions or I need to come back to the methods, then I will have no time to look at the methods, uh, given that most people are perhaps more interested in the results and discussion. But basically, the approach of the study involved uh, biochemical, and, uh, biochemical and physiological assessments. On that biochemical assessment, we look at the damage caused by aging, by uh, assessing the, this um, biomarkers, lateral conductivity, which is an indication of membrane damage, then uh, lipid peroxidation products, conjugated dyes and foie and then protein carbonination. Then we look at uh, antioxidants, Catalyst, glutathione reductase, and peroxide dismutase. And then I also, um, we also look at enzymes that are involved in germination, such as amylase and uh, beta glucanase. The physiological assessment in, included uh, assessing the seed quality in terms of uh, viability and vigor, and then acidling growth, gas exchange, and photochemistry. The Pre-addition treatment, that is the antioxidants used, were applied at 0.2 millimolar, 0.4 millimolar, and 0.6 millimolar concentration. And this was based on a previous reports in the literature and the experiment carried out in our lab, where um, this treatment showed uh, proved to be most beneficial in terms of uh, production of normal seedling. So here I just have a breakdown of the details or, or steps taken in kind of this experiment. C quality was assessed, and then inhibition curve was used to determine the uh, treatment duration for this, uh, uh, at least the duration of application of the antioxidants at various concentrations, and then control deterioration, which is an artificial aging procedure that indicates storage longevity, was used to simulate aging, which is common uh, in orthodox seeds in long term storage. The seeds were control deteriorated from fresh seeds, which had about 85% uh, viability. <clears throat> All seeds used for this study, I need to mention this, are seeds that showed a minimum of 85% viability, I mean, yeah, uh, germination percentage, normal seeding production, yeah. 
and then the seeds were controlled deteriorated to 75% viability, 50% viability called uh, P75, P50, and then 25% viability, which are called uh, P25 in this presentation. So after application of those uh, antioxidant solutions, the seeds were germinated, and then seedlings were scored into normal seedling, abnormal seedling, and mortality. As shown in this figure two, <clears throat> the normal seedlings as, uh, for cabbage is what we can see here, and then normal seedling for, uh, for lettuce. However, we have other uh, class or group of uh, abnormal seedlings like where there is no radical position, but there was um, shoot uh, production. And then for, for, for cabbage, another class was where there was neither radical or shoot production, but the cotyledon became a chlorophyllous. However, this uh, such class of seeds could not make it into the normal seedling, so they were considered mortality. But business of bivacamical acid, which I've already explained, is what uh, I'm showing here. <clears throat> so we go quickly to the results and discussion. For cabbage, control deterioration, that is, the seed that was subjected to control deterioration, had a short aging resistance phase. And this was sometimes called asymptotic phase. And, and then this took just about two days, and then there was uh, an extended period of deterioration, which eventually ended in a total viability loss. That took about 28 days. While for lettuce, there was a rather a prolonged um, asymptotic phase, took about nine days relative to cabbage, and then uh, rather short resistance, I mean, a rather short uh, time to reach total viability loss. That was just about 19 days for lettuce. Previous studies that have employed control deterioration to investigate the phenomenon of seed aging have shown that even when moisture level and temperature are controlled for, remember I mentioned earlier that uh, this temperature and, and, and uh, uh, moisture level are part of the factors that are influencing or that influence a seed deterioration. When these are controlled for, the rate of vigor and viability loss still varies across species and the variation it's a function of the ability of six of different species to resist degradative changes to varying degrees, though, uh, I mean, through their uh, various protective mechanisms. Now, in terms of uh, the aging rate, which was presented in probate values per day, the rate of cabbage seed deterioration was significantly slower than that observed for control deteriorated lettuce seeds. And the difference might be due to the differences in the type and degree of uh, damage incurred. In the asymptotic phase, let me take us back here. In the asymptotic phase, for instance, in lettuce here, and then which took about nine days and two days in uh, brassica and cabbage, the loss of resistance to aging was hard to recognize due to lack of visible change in normal seeding production. And I believe that whether the loss of aging resistance occur before recognizable changes in the normal city production, particularly in lettuce, which had a rather long, uh, lengthy uh, asymptotic phase, so it's worth investigating in uh, much uh, detail, in greater detail. So monitoring seed aging resistance, as well as seed vigor and viability may be helpful to identify early deterioration signs and proper timing for early invigoration or invigorative intervention to improve seed resistance and prolong uh, seed storability. So in terms of the effect of the uh, control deterioration or aging on the various biomarkers of oxidative stress and enzymes associated with germination in both species, cabbage and lettuce, it was observed that control deterioration led to increased solute leakage, which was measured as electrolyte conductivity in the study. impairment or damage in both species. So there was increased solute leakage in both species. And um, in terms of the lipid peroxidation measured as uh, conjugated dyne and 4-HNE, there was accumulation of lipid peroxidation products in lettuce as against, uh, I mean, unlike brassica, that is cabbage, where there was no significant accumulation of lipid peroxidation products. 
there was a accumulation of a protein carbonination and then control deterioration also led to uh, reduced activities of antioxidant enzymes and uh, germ enzymes that are involved in germination, that is alpha amylase and beta vulcanase. Given that control deterioration induced a uh, rise in electrolyte conductivity in cabbage seeds was not accompanied by lipid peroxidation. Research towards understanding what leads to membrane impairment in cabbage seeds during aging uh, is, is, is part of what uh, 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 one can consider, and I'm looking into that. And also, investigation on the lesion imposed by aging at molecular level can also be helpful. The oxidants and the oxid oxidants targets in cabbage appear to be quite different from those in lettuce. And by implication, the promotive effect of these uh, specific periodation treatments differ between the species. Hence, uh, investigation towards understanding the nature of the primary oxidants and uh, oxidants target in specific species will be quite helpful in determining the most suitable periodation treatment to be applied. So such investigation, investigation which uh, we, uh, I'm, I'm also uh, looking forward to carrying out this experiment is to I look at the microscopical analysis, and that will include uh, cytochemical and histochemical um, investigation or localization of reactive oxygen species, and then cross talk between plant growth regulators and look at the reactive oxidants and germination. So, cross talk between plant growth regulator, reactive oxidants, and germination. And this is to prevent the occurrence of temporal conflicts between antioxidant inhibition of damaging oxidants and those that are involved in germination processes. In terms of the effects of both of these periodation treatments on the H seeds, this is a summary because there were a lot of results and that time will not permit to present. So I have to put this together in a, in a form of summary. So uh, the various periodation treatments were able to, were beneficial in brassica oleracea that's cabbage at P25 viability level and then at uh, P50 and P25 in, in lettuce. They were able to enhance uh, normal seeding production at, the, at this uh, level of or levels of uh, deterioration. And then they enhanced uh, uh, seeding vigor index. They also reduced electrolyte leakage combination and um, Enzymes that are involved in uh, germination and even antioxidant enzymes where and their activities were enhanced by this periodation treatment. And then we also have enhanced sibling growth. Amira, and, you have uh, two minutes to finish. All right, thank you very much. So basically, uh, the benefits of this periodation treatment suggest that the approach could be especially useful for seed practitioners trying to integrate valuable endangered or rare seed collection, with which even lead to improvement in germination, vigor, and, and establishment can be highly advantageous since these species already have small population size and perhaps they are limited, they have limited genetic integrity. As such, the, the beneficial seed predation treatment could salvage individual genetic resources uh, for plant propagation and breeding. For example, during ex uh, uh, seed conservation in gene banks, regeneration becomes necessary at, or in all probability when the percentage normal signaling production declines to about 85%. And between this period of early viability loss and regeneration, hardly is there any approach in place to slow down seed regeneration, I mean seed deterioration during storage. So pre-addition treatment as used in this study could protect against reactive oxygen species accumulation during storage, could also reinvigorate and extend seed storability and thereby holding off seed regeneration. So in conclusion, uh, the study, study showed that oxidative stress caused viability loss during aging in both species, but at different rates. And, and there, the whole study also indicated differences in lesion brought about by oxidative damage in both species. And the antioxidants that were used mitigated the effect of physical and biochemical lesions. And then we recommend molecular assessment of aging and reintegration effects. Thank you for your time. Okay, thank you, Alamela. Um, are there any questions from our participants? Um, if not, I'm just going to ask a quick question for you, Alamela. Um, are there any products or you, can you recommend something that we can apply 
um, on um, seeds that will or that can improve the germination success of it. Yes, uh, I will just base my recommendation on this uh, presentation that I've made. There are a lot of uh, biostimulants and, and like this antioxidant can also be applied. Um, and like I mentioned, okay, I think one, one important point that I didn't mention is that the uh, effect of this antioxidant solution could depend on the nature of the main oxidant and the oxidant target in specific species. So it may be species de dependent. That's what I'm trying to say in essence. So it may not be a, a smart thing to just recommend generally because this uh, antioxidant can, uh, can, their effect can be species specific. Thank okay, you. thank you very much, Adamela. It was an interesting talk. All right, um, I think um, let's move on to our um, second um, speaker, um, which is P. Albert. And um, he will be talking about medicinal compounds of African cocoa plants. Over to you. Hello. Um, sure. Can you hear me, Jock? Uh, perfectly. You can continue. Okay. Great. Thank you. Um, okay. Welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining me uh, in this session. I hope that I can stimulate you with this presentation as much as some of these compounds have stimulated people. So uh, let's get into some background of what I will pre be presenting today. So the Erythroxylase family or the coca family consists of uh, four genera. Species within one of these genera, the Erythroxylum genus, um, are known to produce highly valued medicinal compounds such as these you can see here on the figure. So the stars indicate the compounds that are produced within the plants themselves. And these compounds can then be derivatized um, into other compounds, such as the conversion of scopolamine into ipotropium bromide, which, is, which has an annual turnover of more than 1 billion US dollars, uh, making them highly valuable. Uh, the thing is, there's only been limited studies done on the South African varieties, and that is where I come in. So, uh, there are three species locally found within South Africa. Uh, they are Erythroxum delahuense, Emarginatum, and Pictum. They are distributed along the eastern coast of Southern Africa, as indicated there are by the dots. Now, these species have a variety of uh, traditional uses, ranging from um, alleviation of symptoms of uh, abdominal and respiratory ailments, arthritis, and kidney infections. Uh, in vitro studies have shown that they also inhibit the growth of certain bacteria, such as bacteria causing respiratory ailments, infections, and one interesting one that I did not know of, uh, kidney stones. I did not know that bacteria can cause kidney stones, but if this is the case, then these plants can maybe be a cure for that. So one of the South African species, Erythroxum emarginatum, also known as the Natal coca, um, this species can produce some of these compounds indicated by the blue stars on the figure. So these compounds are produced in very, very low concentration. So then the thought came up, well, can we um, upregulate these compounds in tissue culture? We also found uh, that the immediate precursor to cocaine itself is present in Imarginatum. However, we were not able to detect any cocaine. And that is quite interesting. Other literature has uh, shown that we do not require any roots for the production of um, tropane alkaloids. And this differs from the Solanaceae family, which is also a tropane alkaloid producing family, where the compounds are produced in the roots and then stored in the leaves. In the Erythroxylase family, the synthesis and storage is in the leaves itself. So the compounds are produced in the spongy mesophyll cells, and then they are complex to cinnamoquinic acids and then stored in vacuoles in an inactive form and then activated upon tissue damage. Uh, a 2015 study has also shown that we can identify tropane alkaloids in callus cultures of erythroxylum coca. Uh, also that I, I like to refer to the coca as the gangster of the plant family because of its production of cocaine itself. Uh, 
This study has also shown that defense related elicitors such as salicylic acid uh, is not required for the or does not influence the production of tropane alkaloids in tissue culture. Another 2015 study showed that the last step in the cocaine synthesis pathway where uh, egonine methyl ester or methyl egonine is converted into cocaine, that conversion is catalyzed by an enzyme known as cocaine synthase. Now, this is quite interesting because why does the South African plant not produce cocaine if the immediate precursor is present? So Marlies Janssen van Rensburg, during her MSc study, she initiated this uh, where she looked at the gene itself in a marginatum and she found point mutations in this gene. Now this could be possibly the result in the plant not producing cocaine itself, but that requires further investigation. She also discovered that this gene does not contain any introns. So if we were want to do downstream cloning studies, then um, we would not need to work with any RNA, which is quite a blessing because RNA work is quite difficult. So then on to the research questions. Can we stimulate the production of medicinal compounds in vitro? And what will be the effect of um, the, bi the biochemical effect of reintroducing a wild type gene of cocaine synthase into emarginatum? To answer the first question, um, the objective was to stimulate medicinal compound production by uh, precursor feeding trials. And to answer the second research question is to reintroduce the functional allele um, obtained from the donor plant um, erythroxum coca and introducing that into emarginatum and then seeing what happens. So for the tissue culture feeding uh, experiment, this is uh, an outline of the methodology. So these are the precursors that I chose to do this. These precursors play a key role in the biosynthesis of tropane alkaloids. And I tested all of these precursors in three different concentrations, uh, and then also as a combination. And then I also wanted to see what would be the effect of different sugar concentrations um, as well as precursors would that initiate or downregulate specific compound production? So this is the flow of experiments. So the first one is the preparation of the precursors and uh, the leaf calli from emarginatum, then taking roughly the same size calli and placing them into a 24 well plate with the specific precursor. And then after four weeks of incubation at 25 degrees, harvest all of them, freeze dry it to remove all of the um, moisture then methanol sonication and GCMS analysis. So we did GCMS analysis because we wanted to look at volatile medicinal compounds. For the second research aim, um, this is the flow of uh, experimental procedures. So it goes from extracting the DNA using a CTAB method, then um, all the way through to gene purification and cloning it into a TA cloning vector and then eventually screening those vectors to see if the gene is in the right orientation, because if it's in the wrong orientation, the gene will not be produced in the plant. And then eventually transfecting the plant with this gene and then observing what would happen. So then with the results, well, the plans went well, but the experiments did not progress as expected. For the selective precursor feeding, some interesting compounds were discovered. So all of these compounds um, were only found in the callus cultures and not in the leaf material. And they were also only present at certain concentrations of a certain precursor, and some of them only at a certain sugar concentration. Now they have a range of pharmaceutical activity um, from alleviating heart disease to anti-aging, and also to inhibit the growth of cancer cells. But the one that I want to focus on today is this tropine. So the production of tropine occurred when I fed the callus cultures tropinone. So tropinone is then reduced by tropinone reductase one and two into the two isoforms, the, the alpha and the beta form of tropinone. Now this compound can then easily be extracted and then with a few chemical reactions be converted into very highly valued medicinal compounds, such as scopolamine, which is used for organophosphate poisonings, 
and for altitude sickness and also tigloidine. So this was quite a, a, a good find. Then on to the agrobacteria media transformation. Uh, I've initiated two cloning trials. Um, unfortunately, both of them uh, resulted in experimental failures. Uh, but with experimental failures come successful learning opportunities. So I'm going to share some of the learning opportunities, so the, the things that I've learned from the first trial. And the take-home message from the first trial is that shortcuts do not save time. And we'll get to why that is the take-home message. So for the first trial, these are the experimental processes that I've been able to achieve. So it's from uh, isolating the gene from Erythroxum coca, cloning it into the vector, growing it in um, E. coli with antibiotic selection. So these colonies that grow are antibiotic resistant and also contain the gene of interest, which I showed here with the colony PCRs. So this is the band size that I was looking for of the gene of interest. And then afterwards, you, uh, I did a um, screening to see if the gene is in the right orientation. And this one here was in the correct orientation, and this one here is not. And then after that, submitting that to sequencing to see if the gene is mutated or not. So for the first trial, only one of more than 30 colonies that are screened contain the gene in the right orientation. So then we decided, okay, let's, let's send that one then for sequencing to see maybe I can continue with the downstream cloning results of cloning experiments. Uh, upon sequencing and comparing this sequence that I obtained from the clone to a reference sequence that I obtained from the NCBI library of cocaine synthase itself, I found that the gene that I cloned in contained 10 point mutations, which resulted in six amino acid substitutions which gave me a 2% mutation rate. And four of these amino acid substitutions uh, could actually be very problematic to the ultimate folding and functioning of the enzyme in the plant itself. But I am an optimistic person, so I thought maybe this won't affect it too much. So then um, I took the sequences and um, converted them to amino acid sequence. So these are the amino acid sequences. The first one is the reference sequence from the NCBI library to which I compare all of the results. The second one is a donor sequence. So this donor sequence I obtained from the leaf material before cloning. So this is the sequence that I used yeah, initially. And then this is the cloned sequence that I found that only one that worked. And the stars indicate the amino acid substitutions which might have an effect on the folding of the protein. Now, why I compared these two, the donor and the clone sequence, is because I wanted to see, well, is the mutations natural? Like, are they natural uh, because of uh, environmental differences from growing the plant? Because if the plant's grown here in South Africa compared to South America, are those mutations not maybe environmentally induced? And from this comparison, uh, it became apparent that those mutations are in fact experimentally induced and not natural. So it's because of the, the actual PCR reactions, but we will get to that in a bit. So from this, I wanted to show an example of what happens with the substitution. So the number six here at the end, this is an example that I'm going to show, where serine is substituted with cysteine. Now cysteine has a sulfur in the, in the compound structure. Now this sulfur uh, affects the overall chemistry of the amino acid the folding of the protein because it influences the hydrophobicity and the polarity index. And this then um, causes a change in the, the alpha helices. So this purple stripe here is the alpha helix. And this yellow bar here, that is a beta sheet. So in the reference, in the reference sequence, this whole region here is a, a alpha helix where it is now changed into a beta sheet. So this might have an effect. But then I thought, okay, maybe the active site where the actual reaction occurs um, is still intact and the reaction might still happen. So then I can still continue with the downstream cloning events using this specific clone. So what I did then is um, I subjected the amino acid sequences to um, a predictive protein modeling uh, using int fold 5 database. 
And this is the clone, the blue is the clone, and the yellow is the reference. So then I superimpose these two protein models onto each other. And what you can see here is that there are slight differences in the actual predictive folding of the enzyme itself. So here you can see the, the beta sheets that are quite different and the loops and turns, which also differ. But then I thought, okay, maybe the, the actual site where the reaction occurs is still intact and that would still function normally. So then um, I did a, a very quick docking study to see if um, methyl egonine binds in the same place. And from the docking study itself, it showed here's the reference in yellow. The, the compound binds here, if there's an active site at the outside of the protein where the compound, com, compound binds. And then on the clone itself, it binds inside of the protein. And this then basically told me, Sievers, stop working with this specific protein because even if it works at the end, it's going to be very difficult to explain why it does because the predictive models show that it would not work. So then for future work, basically this is that take home message of shortcuts do not save time. In the initial experiments, I used a non-proofreading tag. So a non-proofreading tag uh, only sequences, oh, uh, duplicates DNA in a five to three prime direction. And it doesn't have a proofreading ability. But this tag specifically adds uh, adenosines at the ends of the DNA. Now, these adenosines are important for downstream cloning because these are like sticky feet. So these sticky feet are then required because they then go into this uh, cloning vector here, which contains um, thymines, and then you can go to the downstream cloning events. But with a proofreading tag, what you would need to do is it makes blunt ends, then you need to add an extra experimental step where you add these adenosines for the downstream cloning events. Uh, cloning experiments. So I thought, ha, ah, let's skip this by using a non-proofreader. And that was a big mistake. So for future work is using a proofreader and including that step. So then in conclusion, um, for the first aim, the stimulating of uh, medicinal compounds in tissue culture. So there, uh, uh, I found very interesting results where it is possible to produce interesting compounds from tissue culture experiments by feeding specific precursors. However, I was not able to induce specific tropane alkaloid production. I was able to find tropene, which is very important, um, but I need to do further research into that. The idea behind this is that if it works, then you can do uh, green medicine where you can produce medicinal compounds in tissue culture, which would then cut down on the resources needed to produce specific um, secondary metabolites used in medicine. And these South African plants could show potential in that, like a small green factory. And then with the biochemical effects of reintroducing uh, an unmutated or wild type cocaine synthase, well, that is still underway. But with the point of this, when it works, if it works, is to basically uh, shine light on the understanding of why this gene is mutated in the South African variety. And also, it could also um, sh show us how the biosynthesis of tropane alkaloids in the South African varieties differ from the South American varieties. I would just like to thank um, these people, especially uh, my supervisor, Prof. Mayer, thank you for all the uh, understanding and perseverance and listening to all of my talks. Hey, thank you very much, um, Siebes. And I have to say, I totally agree with you. Shortcuts do not save time. No, 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 no. <laughs> yeah, from experience, yeah. Okay, um, yeah. we have one question in the question and answer uh, panel. Um, what is the practical implication of this current study? So the practical implication of, of the tissue culture feeding itself, it would basically help so that we didn't have to, have to synthesize compounds uh, in a lab. Uh, so with tropane alkaloids specifically, these alkaloids, they are still being extracted from plant material uh, because it's, too, it's not um, economically feasible to synthesize the tropane ring structure. 
So if we can stimulate the production of tropine, for example, and upregulate that to make uh, large quantities of it, then we can extract that and then convert it into the higher valued um, blockbuster compounds. And in that we would, you know, assist the economic strain of uh, the medical field. And then with the cloning one, it's just, yeah, it's um, kind of trying to see what is the difference between the South African varieties compared to the South American varieties. Because if egonine methyl ester is produced and not cocaine, what happens to that egonine methyl ester? Because according to literature, that is the immediate precursor to cocaine and it's not used for anything else. So what is the plant in South Africa using that compound for then? Right, no, yeah. Thank you very much and good luck with your research. Thank you. Right. Our um, next speaker is Samson um, Shipanga and he will be talking about um, genotyping selection for a target environment. So over to you, Samson. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity. I'm uploading my presentation. Please let me know if you can see it. Uh, are you able to see it? Samson, we can, we can see it. Um, you can continue with your presentation. Uh, thank you. Yes, yeah. So I'm presenting to you these results. Uh, it's on our studies on chickpea uh, genotype selection for a target environment. And our target environment here in South Africa is northeastern, the Limpopo and the Pumalanga site. And our goal in this project is really to identify the heat and the drought tolerant genotypes that have got suitable agronomic uh, traits for production in the region. So in the uh, area report, we established that, you know, the use of the crawl through fluorescence, especially the FVFM, um, which is the operation efficiency of the photosystem two for photochemistry, and it's commonly known as the FVFM, it's actually a suitable uh, phenotyping trait. So in that report, we showed that when the chickpea uh, genotypes, four genotypes in this case, were grown in three chambers differing in temperature regimes, the chickpea uh, in the hottest uh, chamber we, there is accession number seven, the one in the blue, that really had the FVFM value similar to the ones in the control, showing really tolerance to heat stress. Well, as the other uh, three genotypes actually were below the control. However, in, in these other three uh, genotypes, we have accession seven that was um, actually similar to accession so we have accession three that is actually similar to accession seven but significantly higher to the two genotypes and this pattern of results were actually consistent for other you know, uh, with other physiological parameters including concentration of chlorophyll stomata conductors photosynthesis and the concentration of anthocyanins. Looking at the seed yield, this hot chamber in the, for the seed yield, actually the seed yield declined relative to the control for all the genotypes, but accession seven was actually higher than the other three genotypes. And, you know, um, from this, we established that FVFM you know, can be used as a phenotyping tool. And this you know, um, physiological parameter has an advantage 
actually several advantages that it is non-destructive and also relatively rapid. And of course, from this, we took that this accession is quite promising, the accession seven with regards to uh, heat tolerance. We then you know, exposed uh, the four genotypes to field conditions, actually to test this use of chlorophyll for instance, uh, you know, as a phenotyping tool under field conditions. And we did this along uh, in size that way, along a temperature gradient and at three sites. So the combination of the three sites and the four genotypes gave us, you know, a genotype and environmental interaction, which is the focus of this presentation. So of course, the sites are in the Northeastern South Africa and the studies were conducted, you know, in the winter season, chickpea is a winter season crop of 2016 and 2017. So here are the sites in the Northeastern part of our country. So we took, um, we used the farm at the University of Venda as our hot site. So in that area, you know, the temperatures, you know, range between 23 to 29 degrees. Another site was Lewis uh, Tricat with temperatures ranging, these are like average temperatures ranging 20 to 27. And the Polokwane was our third site and Polokwane is a cooler site uh, with temperatures ranging 12 to 21 degrees. However, during the winter season, we also assessed the time, the time experiments were conducted and the minimum and maximum winter temperatures in these sites. Venda gave us 12, 24 degrees, Louis Trickert, 7, 22, and four and 20 degrees Celsius in Polokwane give us a good temperature gradient. But not only temperature, we also rainfall was also in a, a gradient, um, reducing gradual from the University of Venda that recorded an annual rainfall or gives an annual rainfall of eight to five millimeters, 540 at But I lost my, my table there. So 540 at Louis Trika and then 495 at Polokwane. We measured the uh, actual uh, rainfall and temperature conditions during the study period and indeed confirming that a uh, uh, vendor farm really experienced hotter um, you know, temperatures relative to Polokwane in both seasons and also noting that it is a summer rainfall region and the plants were grown in winter when actually the rainfall was very little to actually um, nothing during the period of production. Soil physical characteristics were also assessed you know for these sites and in, uh, it was noted that actually Polokwane uh, recorded the list of the elements measured, including nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, calcium, as well as, uh, as carbon content. However, you know, let's, let's note that the soils are sandy loam, and these are considered well productive soils for agricultural crops. The experimental design took a factorial treatment of the three sites and the four chickpea genotypes. We followed all the recommended agronomic practices for chickpea growing and the physiological data collected at flowering and grain yield at harvest. We measured the growth of fluorescence, the FVFM um, from dark adapted leaves using a palm chlorophyll fluorometer, and we also measured the non-structural carbohydrates from dried leaves um, using enzymatic method. And these data were subjected to a two-way 
uh, ANOVA, testing the effect of genotype and the environment separately for each year. So our results um, for the FVFM, actually we noted an interaction of genotype and environment for the FVFM. And noting that uh, for the genotype accession seven, um, the FVFM values were actually higher than the accession eight, as well as accession two, but similar to accession three. Another point to note is that at, uh, the values were similar for, you know, for all the sites, you know, with the three genotypes. So the three genotypes recorded similar FVFM values at all the sites, except accession number two, where the FVFM declined at the warmer site of Venda. This uh, non-structural carbohydrates, for this one, there was no interaction between site and the genotypes. So here we are showing the effect of the environment and the genotypes, the main effects. And we notice that for accession, uh, for, for starch concentration in the leaves, it was actually lower at Polokwane, which is our cooler site, relative to uh, the concentration of starch in the leaves of plants at Venda. But if you look at the sucrose and the glucose, there was no difference between the two uh, sites. Looking at the uh, genotypes, looking at the starch, uh, we noticed that accession seven was actually similar to accession uh, three, but accession seven was significantly higher to accession two. There was really no much pattern for sucrose and the glucose on the genotypic differences. I will not say much on that. Uh, it was interesting to note for our results that there were actually uh, good correlations for each site um, between the CD8 and the FVFM and, and also for the leafy starch. So here, uh, the, the different uh, signs, yeah, designs, they are representing different uh, genotypes and the shading is representing a different size. So like the top part here, these are the, uh, the genotypes at uh, Venda, sorry, at Polokwane. The Venda is the one below here, the unshaded ones. But the important message here is that there were good correlations between the two. Um, the only exception to talk about is the uh, correlation between seed weight and starch at Venda, where actually instead of getting a positive correlation like in the other sites, it was a negative correlation at Venda. But looking at the overall, um, you know, picture we are getting from these results. It's really giving us the impression that indeed FVFM um, is a good uh, phenotyping tool, and you know we can use it in the field as well. And also uh, the genotype accession number seven seems to be doing well in terms of tolerating heat stress. We look at the grain yield. Um, and for the grain yield, there was no interaction, again, between the uh, genotype and the environment. So for the different sites, in 2017, we see that Polokwane yielding much higher than Venda, whereas in 2016, there were no differences between Polokwane and Venda, and there was a decline at Lewis Trickert. And we can explain this decline was due to infestation by pod borer. 
uh, looking at the genotypes, no differences in 2016, but in 2018, there was a decline, especially significantly between accession seven um, and the accession three, comparing it to accession eight. And if we now go to the, uh, the main point that we want us perhaps to discuss is this lack of genotype and environmental interaction, especially on the CBUs. And this is an important factor to discuss, especially in studies where you want to recommend a, a specific genotype or a genotype for uh, suitable for that environment. And in this case, we are noting that accession seven is actually heat, uh, heat tolerant, it's showing good characteristics of tolerating heat. And also it's stable across the environments, looking at the three sites that you know we studied. And this is because of this lack of inter interaction. However, we are also aware that the, the implication of this lack of genotype and environment interaction could be that uh, could have you know on the uh, genetic diversity. Uh, this lack of interaction has implication on the genetic diversity and the vulnerability of the genotype to other abiotic and even biotic stresses. So we are being cautious here. And the, if there are experts in this kind of studies in the room, I would uh, welcome their comments. Because of this um, kind of observation, we now you know, recommending perhaps further studies on include on this genotype and of course other genotypes so we are recommending a comprehensive assessment of the genotype by environmental interaction that would use 12 genotypes you now that will have different tolerance characteristics to abiotic stress and perhaps also including the size from three to six and the, uh, doing it for at least two cropping seasons um, we are also cautious that perhaps we need to use even more statistical analysis that will assess the adaptability and the stability of the genotypes, including these um, linear regression models that do that, as well as the AMMI model that has got also ability to assess uh, adaptability and stability. That's where we are in, in these studies. And the, I acknowledge the members of the group. Um, so these members are coming from various institutions. And of course, the study is funded by NRIF and the University of Cape Town. Thank you for your attention. OK, thank you very much, Samson. It was very nice seeing you again, even if it, if it was over at online conference. <laughs> I think the last time I saw you was at the whoa, wait, yeah, a few years back at the SOP conference. <laughs> uh, in any case, yeah, um, let's see. Uh, any questions and answers? Uh, is the performance of the study genotypes at different locations better or poor as compared to the commonly commercialized cultivar? Yeah, a good question. I, I, I wish there was commercially acceptable cultivar for chickpea because apparently uh, there are chickpea is not grown you know here in south africa for commercially so we're actually trying to assess you know the suitability of chickpea production in this part of south africa so we don't have really basis for comparison locally in terms of genotypes okay Thank you very much. Um, I think we can move on to our next um, speaker, um, Ay Karen. Uh, I think it's a she, is she here? All right, I will I presume she is here. Anushka, oh, sorry. <laughs> All right, okay. Uh, yeah, she will be doing a review on Zoo um, Antele um, and the response to environmental stress. So, um, Anushka, you can continue. Um, I just want to share. 
Um, Prof, can you see my the PowerPoint can, presentation? Yes, I can see you and I can hear you. Okay, and the presentation as well, yes. And the, and the presentation as well. Okay, great. Okay. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Today I will briefly share with you the research we did um, on Zumantala and their response to environmental stress. Global warming recently has become a serious problem which shows an increased threat to both terrestrial and aquatic ecosystems. The most concerning of which is the changing surface temperatures on aquatic and marine systems. In marine ecosystems, sea surface temperatures have risen approximately 1 to 2 degrees Celsius since pre-industrial times. South Africa has already seen considerable temperature increases since the 1960s, with average temperature increases increasing by 1.5 degrees Celsius, with more marked increases across arid and inland areas of the country. The rate of temperature changes is fluctuating, with the highest rate of temperature increases identified during the mid-1970s to early 1980s, as well as highest rates again observed in the late 1990s to mid-2000s, as seen in the data published by the World Bank Group. This has led to unprecedented mass coral bleaching events, which have made coral reefs one of the most threatened ecosystems on Earth. A report compiled in 2020 by the Global Coral Reef Monitoring Network provides a more detailed scientific picture to the date of the tall elevated temperatures have taken on the world's reefs. Within this report, researchers explain that even though coral reefs cover approximately 0.2% of the world's surface, they support about a quarter of marine species, harboring the highest biodiversity of any of the world's ecosystem. Of, unfortunately, they have been the victim of these recent increased sea surface temperatures. Studies suggest that global warming is the primary driver, driver of coral degradation in oceans around the world and have substantially altered the abundance and species composition of coral communities. Extreme coral bleaching has been recorded in 1998 and 2002. However, over the last five years, three coral mass coral bleaching events have also occurred just want to find the mouse, in 2016, 17, and then 2020. South Africa and African reefs has been surprisingly less impacted from coral bleaching events than the Great Barrier Reef off the Australian coast for two reasons. Firstly, bleaching levels are highest at shallower sites due to increased light penetration and solar irradiance as well as localized heating and ultraviolet radiation. As the minimum depth of South African coral reefs is about 8 meters, bleaching conditions are less severe than for coral reefs closer to the surface. As a result, there is a negative cor correlation between depth and bleaching percentage. Secondly, seasonal upwelling also contribute to a lessening in South African coral bleaching. The upwelling developing from the Benguela current on the west coast of South Africa is responsible for the uplifting of cooler waters during the El Nino event in 1989 and reduced coral bleaching significantly. As a result, seasonal upwelling protects the coral reefs from severe bleaching by breaking the intense heat stratification within the water column and reducing the heat irradiance upon the coral reefs. Even with the advantage of depth, wave, energy, and seasonal upwelling, community concerns should be raised, and early response and preventative measures should already be in place for possible future bleaching anomalies. Sclerectinian corals are in a mutualistic relationship with dinoflagellate referred to as one During coral bleaching, these algal endosymbionts are expelled from their respective coral hosts, causing the coral to lose color and become white. The general consensus is that coral bleaching is due to the photosynthetic dysfunction in the zoanthalae, thereby the photoinhibition of photosynthetic electron transport pathways. In effect, the photo damage is due to the production of reactive oxygen species in the telecoid photosynthetic apparatus of the zoanthalae, leading to oxidative stress within the holobiont. Figure 5 demonstrates the process of oxidative coral bleaching and the thermal stress response within both where's my mouth? Yeah, the zoanthale as well as the coral host. 
Reactive oxygen species are produced within the chloroplast of the zoan thalli. And um, we have several mechanisms associated with photosystem two and photosystem one, el catalyzed electron transfer. During the reaction, hydrogen peroxide is generated within the zoan thalli cell and accordingly diffuses from the zoan thalli cell into the coral host cytoplasm. Once inside the coral cytoplasm, the hydrogen peroxide might either be neutralized by enzymatic and non-enzymatic antioxidant pathways or be converted into more noxious reactive oxygen species referred to as the hydroxyl radical. During oxidative stress, the latter is indeed the result. Numerous protective mechanisms are in place within the zoanthalae to decrease the effect of bleaching. These mechanisms include xanthophyll cycling, the production of small heat shock proteins, conformation or change in lipid composition, and the production of stress-stable enzyme complexes within the electron transport pathways. Take a look at figure six. Within a thermal tolerant zoanthalae clay, both heat shock protein 70 and heat shock protein 90, as well as protein folding and unfolding chaperones, such as DNAJ and antioxidant pathways such as iron superoxide desmutase are expressed and activated within the zoanthalae cell, each within its respective organelles. With the, this rapid response, the zoanthalae cell mediates thermal stress and can ensure protection against oxidative stress within their cellular compartments. Within a thermal sensitive zoanthalae clay, these mediating responses are not as effectively activated. Thus, some heat shock proteins are expressed and activated, but ultimately the cell still produces re reactive oxygen species and can cause damage to the thalagoid membrane within the chloroplast and subsequently damage within other compartments of the cell. Let's just quickly look at heat shock proteins. Heat shock proteins are molecular chaperones that are responsible for protein folding and unfolding aggregation, degradation, and transport, thereby helping to regulate cellular reactions within a cell. Heat shock proteins are classified into families according to their molecular mass. Heat shock protein 70 and heat shock protein 90 are two of the major cytosolic heat shock proteins of semiodinium that contribute to the thermal stress response of the respective coral host. Additionally, some studies have observed that heat shock protein 70 can withstand temperature rises above 29 degrees Celsius, leading to an increased heat shock protein 70 gene expression by up to 20%. But temperatures above 35 degrees Celsius decrease heat shock protein 70 gene expression by 60%. In contrast, elevated temperatures cause a decrease in heat shock protein 90 gene expression. This may indicate that a reduction in the expression of heat shock protein 90 inhibits a heat shock transcription factor that regulates the expression of the heat shock proteins and leads to the activation of heat inducible genes and heat acclimation. This allows both zoanthalae and the coral to adapt to unforeseen temperature fluctuations. Studies show that symbiotic status did not control the expression of both heat shock protein genes. Therefore, the initial thermal stress response is within the semiodinium, independent of the coral host. Heat shock protein 90 operates as a dimer, influencing development and epigenetic changes. Heat shock protein 90 is represented in four forms, two cytosolic forms, an inducible alpha form, as well as a constitutive beta form, and mitochondrial and endoplasmic reticulum homologues. Induced heat shock proteins are also present depending on the semiodinium genotype. As a result, heat shock proteins can exhibit genetic variation among individuals of a species and therefore a difference in stress tolerance. Table 1 represents an elaboration on the function of different heat shock proteins in Zuantale. Heat shock proteins mostly interact with surrounding proteins and change their function according to the cell stress response recognize and bind to non-native proteins, and function as oligomers. Cytosolic heat shock protein 70 and mitochondrial heat shock protein 70 are responsible for maintaining peptides in an unfolded conformation, which allows these peptides to be transported through pores situated in the mitochondrial membrane. 
He took protein 60 and he took protein 10, then assist in the folding and unfolding imported proteins within the mitochondria. So Antala are also able to modify and determine the amount of each of proteins required for cell regulation and symbiosis. The physiological and distribution no differences between zoanthalate clades can influence which each of proteins the zoanthalate contain and to what extent they will be expressed, just referring back to the thermal tolerant and thermal sensitive zoanthalate clades. This suggests that due to Zuantala's ability to determine the amount and type of vitro proteins present during a heat response, the Zuantala can regulate both the host respective vitro proteins as well as their own. The antioxidant and cellular stress capabilities of both Zuantala and the coral host also influence the rate of coral bleaching. Antioxidant pathways such as the asada Hollywell pathway and xanthophyll cycling can be used to protect the coral host from oxidative damage by reactive oxygen species. An individual can respond differently to each oxidative threat, depending primarily on higher and lower levels of antioxidant compounds within the individual species. Finally, the majority of antioxidant mediating pathways entail the release of antioxidant enzymes such, such as superoxide desmutase, ascorbate peroxidase, and catalase, which are responsible for detoxifying the reactive oxygen species. Antioxidant pathways act together to activate superoxide radicals and hydrogen peroxide and prevent coral hosts from bleaching. Superoxide desmutase is responsible for the desmutation and of superoxide into oxygen and hydrogen peroxide, and catalase for the inactivation of hydrogen peroxide into water and oxygen. It's important to mention that an increase in hydrogen peroxide not only induces antioxidant activity within the exposed coral tissue, but these antioxidant activities also occur within the zooanthellate tissue in response to an increase in reactive oxygen species. Several studies have suggested that environmental bioengineering can be an important consideration for future coral reef restoration strategies. The upregulation of gene expression, which may mitigate thermal stress induction of any of the physiological aspects discussed earlier, can ensure stable coral zoanthellae symbiosis in the future. It presents a viable alternative strategy to prevent reefs amidst climate change. However, even though Zuvantale presents promising candidates for genetic engineering, these dinoflagellates possess unusual biological features that have made gene editing within its genome very much difficult. They contain one of the largest nuclear genomes between 1.5 and 112 gigabase pairs known, which exceeds that of the human haploid genome size. It, the nuclear genome is permanently condensed in liquid crystalline chromosomes, and furthermore, plant splicing and polystronic mRNAs occur, occurs and plastid genomes are divided into mini-circles, as well as many more unusual genetic traits different to that of the normal eukaryotic genome. For a more detailed discussion and review of all these topics, you can gladly scan the QR code and, and read it in the article produced by myself and Professor Sandra Barnard here. Thank you very much. I hope it was very much informative. Okay, thank you very much, Anushka. Um, I quickly see, can you tell me the novelty of this study? Um, we, I just wanted to come back to the to you, yes. Um, originally, we thought about the project to see if we can continue with the project for a longer time over and to see, well, we have to do a lot of literature um, informa information first, because this, this specific topic of genetically modifying Zuantale isn't a broadly researched topic. So I think there's only about four studies that have attempted this. Um, and they made considerable stride, but still had an unsuccessful objective towards the end. So we wanted to gather, gather as most, uh, the most information as possible for future reference to studies that want to attempt 
this or if we wanted to go further and attempt this. Yeah. Um, Prof, I can't hear you. You are on mute. That. <laughs> <laughs> I'm muting my microphone. Otherwise, we get an echo here on the on the uh, computer. Yeah, yeah. Uh, just a, a question um, on these um, uh, um, zoos and today. Have the photosynthetic efficiency been measured on these organisms or not? And not during our study, but there has been a lot of um, studies that have referred to doing a practical study and culturing them and looking at their temperature variances, depending on which clay they had. Um, we, we initiated a study like that, but our, culture, our cultures didn't work exactly how we planned. So we couldn't continue with a, temp a temperature study or a light irradiance study um, as of yet. Um, so, but there are studies and during the studies that I mentioned, the four studies they did, um, or they bought cultures, or they did culture the zuantale, and um, extracted them, isolated them from um, specific coral species, and sequenced to see which um, zuantale clay they had, um, of which they then implied the genetic editing on them. But they are efficient. It's just a genetic problem that makes it a bit wonky. It's difficult to measure. Yeah. 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 <laughs> All right. So, um, yeah. We had a bit of time. I just have one more question for you. Maybe you know, maybe you don't. Uh, these heat shock proteins um, uh, in these organisms um, are they the same as those in plants, um, or do they differ? Um, I would. From the knowledge that I have, I would say they are more or less the same type of heat shock proteins, but I think their function and the way they are deployed within the cell would definitely differ um, because it's an entire different environment. If you look at terrestrial and marine, um, especially temperature wise with all the pressure that's working in on them as well. But I think heat shock protein 70 and 19, I, I, I'm not 100% sure, but I do presume that they have the same function, they just deploy differently within the Zuantale. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. Um, then we move on to our last um, speaker, um, which is um, Jeremiah. And he will be talking about drought stress responses of Edamame. Jeremiah, over to you. Hello. Hi, right, Jeremiah. Are you there? Can you hear me? I I can hear you. Okay. All your okay. problems sorted okay. out. Can you see my screen as well? I can see you. Yeah, I can see you, and I can hear you. I don't see your presentation yet. Uh. Okay. Let, let me wait. Set shared now. The thing is, it, it's on. It, it's on full screen, so I can't go. Try pressing Windows D and at the bottom on your, on your on your keyboard. Jeremiah, on your keyboard, there's a little button with four v windows. Press that with together with D. That will take you back to your desktop. Then just click on the on your Google Chrome icon. Okay. Okay. And then. Yes, so what do you see at the moment? Okay. Jeremiah? I just check. 
Yes, press share and then choose window. I'm sorry. Yes, after you press share, um, click window. Okay, I chose. Okay, then you will see your presentation there. So just click on your presentation. And then. Yes. Yes. Uh, Jeremiah, alternatively, uh, would you mind just quickly sharing your presentation with me? No, we can't see it. Would you mind just um, emailing your presentation for me and then I'll share it on your behalf? Okay. Uh, I want some the Dropbox link you want to share. I'm not sure if okay. it's out there. Yes, I have it. I have it. I'm going to share it now. I'm opening uh, it now. I'll share it now for you. Okay. Um, maybe just switch off your camera so it will help with your bandwidth. Okay, Jeremiah, I've shared your presentation. Let's just see if we lost uh, Jeremiah. Jeremiah, just switch on your microphone. Jock, it seems like we've lost um, Jeremiah. Um, okay, yeah. Maybe yeah. Let's just give him another few seconds. Maybe he'll join us again. I hope so. Okay. Right, um, Jeremiah, are you there? I can see your icon, but it looks like um, you have muted your microphone. Jeremiah, just um, close your presentation on your side and then just activate your microphone, please. There we go. Can you hear me? Yes, Jeremiah, we can hear you. I'm sharing your slides so you can proceed. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah, I'm, I'm very... This is my this. laptop is a bit slow today. Okay, my name is Jeremiah Sasa from the University of the Free State, and uh, I'm going to be talking to you um, about this project, the photosynthetic efficiency in carbohydrate responses of six adamami cultivars under drought stress. So uh, we recently published a paper on this study, which uh, 
was accepted in the plant journal uh, volume two and i'm hoping it will be available on the net by the end of this week uh, please next slide so uh edamame originated edamame originated east of asia it is also popular in the usa and many parts of the world because of its high nutritional value health and economic benefits Edamame contains about 85 to 40 percent proteins, 18 to 22 percent oil. It also contains many vitamins and minerals. The soybean has lower levels of cholesterol. It helps in preventing heart diseases, increase bone density, and reduce the risks of prostate and mammary cancer. So it is important to promote the soybean in Africa because the continent has the highest percentage of undernourished people in the world. In addition, South African population is expected to reach 65 million by 2030. So there is a need to increase nutritious food production to keep up with the population rise. So edamame is the best crop to promote in the country and Africa as a whole. There is currently no recognized commercial production of edamame in South Africa and very few studies done on the crop. Edamame is a high water demanding crop, so its cultivation is influenced by drought, which is caused by climate change, and about 40% of edamame crop yield is reduced by drought stress. Next slide, please. Okay, so the effect of drought stress in plants is the alteration of their metabolic processes, which result in poor crop yield. Plants can be tolerant or susceptible to abiotic stress. And plant tolerant to abiotic stress includes modifications in their biochemical, physiological, and morphological features. Drought stress increases the, the production of reactive oxygen species and reduction in stomatal apage, which decreases the rate of photosynthesis. It is well documented that carotenoid accumulation improves drought tolerance by enhancing antioxidant activity and improves membrane stability. The accumulation of soluble sugars and starch was also linked to drought tolerance. And the cell, wall, the cell walls of drought stress plants is strengthened by the changes in structural carbohydrates and fish. Okay, so the aims of this study were to investigate the effects of drought stress on the photosynthetic capacity and cell wall modifications of six edamame cultivars to establish the physiobiochemical mechanisms responsible for drought tolerance in edamam. And the objectives of the study were to elucidate the effects of drought stress on the photosynthetic efficiency and the effects of drought stress on the cell wall modifications and relationships between the photosynthetic efficiency parameters and cell wall responses. So our first objectives, uh, our, our first objective, we grew uh, edamame cultivars. We had six edamame cultivars, HES354, which um, has uh, was previously reported to have uh, most of its yield reduced by drought stress. And HES429, HES429 was previously reported to be stable and um, it produces good yield under drought stress. UVE7 UV was also reported to be a stable cultivar, as well as UVE8 and UVE14. UVE14 is stable under drought stress, uh, but its yield is reduced by drought stress. And UVE17 was previously reported to be a susceptible cultivar. And uh, these plants were grown in the greenhouse at temperatures of 25 degrees during the day in 18 degrees at night. And initially, all the plants were, were, were water to 100% water holding capacity, Still a trifolate leaf stage in which uh, 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 some of them were subjected to 30%, which was their drought stress. And the experimental design was split, plot randomized with three biological replications. So what we did um, with non-destructive methods of um, measuring chlorophyll fluorescence and stomatal conductance. So this uh, were done by using a portable PE uh, chlorophyll fluorometer. 
to measure AV over FM, PI absorbance, and PI total. And um, for, leave, for stomatal conductance, we used uh, leaf porometer. So the measurements were done between uh, 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. for stomatal conductance we done between 10 a.m. and 1 o'clock because the metal conductance take longer to do the measurements than What we also did, we extracted uh, pigments, chlorophyll A, chlorophyll B, as well as the carotenoids because uh, chlorophyll A and chlorophyll B uh, uh, can indicate the photosynthetic capacity of, of, of plants and uh, carotenoids have the, have the possibility of protecting uh, plants against, uh, against, reactive, against reactive oxygen species. So we extracted pigments and measured chlorophyll A at 663 nanometers, chlorophyll B at 645, and carotenoids at 470 nanometers. And what we also did under this objective, we extracted uh, uh, non-structural carbohydrates using megazyme kits, we extracted glucose, trihalose, and total starch. We also extracted total sucrose content using an uh, inverted uh, method and did TLC, uh, thin layer chromatography, to visualize um, the type of sugars available in the in the plant leaf tissues. And uh, we did analysis using GenStat uh, release 19 software and means were separated using the Fischer's protect uh, least significant difference LSD test at P equal to 0 0.05. So our find on that the FV over FM of HES uh, 429 and UVE 17 was, a, was significantly increased by drought stress uh, at port. And when we look at PI absorbance, so what you also find is that PI absorbance uh, is actually more sensitive to drought stress compared to FV over FM. So we found that HAS 429 17 has significantly increased PI um, absorbance. But when you look at the PI total, PI total is the performance index of the photosystems. We found that UVE 17 has had declined PI total, which means that uh, this cultivar had uh, overall tot, uh, poor uh, photosynthetic capacity uh, during drought stress, especially here, at, uh, especially during the pot filling stage. Because as you can see, at flowering stage, uh, there were no, there were not much uh, significant changes, but at pot filling stage, that uh, HS429 was actually uh, the most uh, stable with better photosynthetic capacity. So, looking at the total performance index, UVE17 in this case was not performing well under drought stress. And also looking at our pigments. Uh, let me start with uh, carotenoids. We found that at pot filling stage, uh, UVE17 had significantly uh, reduced carotenoid content. This also tells us that uh, UVE17 lacked protection um, of the photosystems and proteins against um, photo damage or against uh, the reactive oxygen species. This also uh, confirms why uh, UVE17 had uh, reduced uh, PI total. So this means that because of uh, the lack of protection, UVE17 uh, was subjected to reduction in photosynthetic capacity. Uh, but when we look at uh, uh, chlorophyll A and chlorophyll B, we found that um, the first graph is chlorophyll A. We found that HES429 and UVE17 had chlorophyll A content. But uh, looking at our chlorophyll B content, we found that at port filling stage, HES for and HES429 had significantly increased uh, chlorophyll B. So what we notice is that uh, there was interconversion of chlorophyll A to chlorophyll B under drought stress. Uh, so that is a common uh, that is a common uh, reaction uh, under drought stress by chlorophyll A oxygenase. 
by chlorophyll at A oxygenase. So the problem with this is that when uh, chlorophyll A is converted to chlorophyll B, that might reduce uh, the rate of photosynthesis a bit. So looking at UVE14, we see that the, the chlorophyll B of UVE14 was not uh, increased. And looking at the chlorophyll A, we found that it was not uh, interconverted, meaning that this cultivar had a stable a photosynthetic capacity also under thyroid stress. And look, I found that at, at flowering stage, all cultivars had significantly reduced uh, stomatal conductance. But looking at pot filling stage, um, most cultivars had uh, improved their stomatal conductance, meaning that they were improving their photosynthetic capacity. But looking at UVE17, its stomatal conductance was further significantly reduced, meaning that um, uh, this will have a, a, decreased uh, a decreased rate of photosynthesis, and this cultivar could, could uh, overheat due to closed stomata, and that will further reduce its rate of photosynthesis. And looking at our sugars, we found that um, at flowering stage, uh, starch was uh, actively converted, was actively hydrolyzed to form glucose, meaning that during flowering stage, there was high demand of glucose. This tells us that uh, glucose played a very vital role uh, uh, during drought stress in edamame uh, uh, at flowering stage. But when you look at, at, at pot filling stage, we found that um, uh, uh, starch hydrolyzing enzymes were probably inhibited which resulted in reduced glucose content at, at port filling stage. And as you can see that there was high starch content at, at, at port filling stage. And what we also see is that UVE14 in the flowering stage had significantly high starch at uh, port filling stage. Uh, HS429 has significantly high uh, starch content, meaning of these, of these two cultivars had the capacity of producing starch. And uh, we also did a uh, trihalose. Trihalose is important because it, 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 it protects uh, plasma membranes and proteins from dehydration. But we found that this, this sugar might not be involved in, in, in protecting, um, it might not be playing a role under drought stress in edema because uh, UVE 17 produced the same it was produced in HS429. Please keep in mind that UVE17 is susceptible to drought stress. What we saw it was an increase in sucrose content. At, 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 sucrose is an unreducing sugar, meaning that this uh, was produced so that it is transported to form seeds at the sink. And uh, these are my TLC plates, but uh, they just confirm uh, the, the trihalose, sucrose, and glucose results, which are, also, which are already discussed. Please, let's move on. So our next objective, uh, it was studying cell wall sugars. So we, we did X-ray diffraction, FTIR, and LCMS to study the whole holocellulitic content of, of edamame leaves. We also study total phenolic content and acid soluble lignin content. The found here is that um, most cultivars have significantly increased uh, lignin content. So we only did this study at port filling stage uh, because uh, uh, Van der Merwe and Molloy 2021 found that in edamame, most biochemical changes happened at, at port filling stage. So we decided to focus on port filling stage. At port filling stage, uh, there was high uh, uh, lignin content uh, in, in most cultivars, except in UVE14. And uh, it was not significantly increased in UVE17. Total phenolic content was not significant, meaning that uh, the, the total phenols might not play, play a role in, 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 in either mammal tolerance under drought stress. Uh, and 
what we did also, we did FTIR. Uh, so as you can see, I indicate green there is the regions where, uh, for an example, this region is 3,000. Is three thousand five hundred to three thousand. It's a is 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 there is for crystalline cellulose. So we found that the crystallinity index was high here in UVE fourteen and UVE eight. So this indicates that the the cell walls of these two cultivars was more intact compared to the rest of the cultivars. What we found with HES four two nine is that there was a slight decline there. In, in crystalline cellulite, cellulitic content. But when you look at other regions, these other regions are, whole, uh, are hemicellulosis and lignin. Since were not decreased by drought stress, as, we, as was also observed in UVE8 and UVE14, meaning that the, the cell walls of these, three, of these three cultivars was improved under drought stress to protect the plants uh, uh, from dehydration compared to UVE uh, 17, HES 354, and UVE 7. As you can see that um, the hololytic uh, content was uh, declined um, under drought stress. So uh, our XRD results uh, reveal that UVE 14, as we can see indicated by red there, had, uh, it's, it, it's for a uh, high crystallinity index. So it shows that UVE in had higher crystallinity index. Uh, so it's just confirming what we already saw on the FTIR spectrum. And uh, finally, our third objective, uh, this one is correlations and principal comp component analysis. So we found that uh, UVE 14, um, yeah, it's UVE14 and HS. HS429 was closely associated with high yield because we also did uh, yield parameters. So UVE14, uh, UVE8, and um, uh, UVE14, UVE8 were closely associated with, um, with high chlorophyll A content, which means they had better photosynthetic capacity. HS354 was, was at the center of the PCA, meaning that most parameters studied for this cultivar were reduced under drought stress. And that is not a good uh, trait uh, to, to use under drought tolerance in this cultivar. So when we look at uh, pot filling stage, we found that HS429 was still associated with a very high yield in chlorophyll B. UVE14 was also still associated with, with high chlorophyll A and sucrose and high stomatal conductance, which means that it uh, had better photosynthetic capacity under drought stress. Uh, in conclusion, the physiological and biochemical data acquired in this study confirms that HES429 and UVE14 are less sensitive to drought stress than UVE17. The carotenoids play a very significant protective role in protecting the photosynthesis, the photosystems because positive relationships with the PI absorbance and PI total. And they significantly reduce stomatal conductance in UVE17 contributes to its ability, thereby affecting carbon dioxide assimilation uh, process leading to less yield. And the starch could could be another factor that explains drought tolerance in edamame because of the strong positive relationship it had with chlorophyll A uh, and yield parameters, the total seed mass per plant, and the cell wall modifications that could be associated with drought tolerance in edamame include hemicellulose and lignin, as we saw there. And therefore, carotenoids, photosystem 2 and photosystem performance indexes, starch, micellulose, and lignin are recommended as additional physiological mechanisms of drought tolerance in edamame. And these are my references. Uh, thank you so much for listening. I would like my supervisors, Dr. M. S. Mafa and Dr. I would also like to thank this institution and the 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 and the
Uh, thank you very much, um, Jeremiah. Again, you have a nice uh, example um, in your research on how chlorophyll fluorescence can be used uh, to distinguish between different cultivars in terms of um, drought stress. All right, um, we have a question here. Uh, what would be an explanation for AV over FM to increase with drought stress, if I heard you correctly? Okay, so um, if, if FM is uh, normally used uh, to assess the health of the plant under drought stress. So uh, normally, uh, there are many uh, uh, reports that, that suggest that FV over FM uh, is not uh, sensitive to abiotic stress. That's why many researchers prefer to use PI uh, absorbance and PI total. So the increase in FV over FM under drought stress could uh, simply mean that uh, the plant was not struggling under drought stress, but we cannot for sure uh, say whether uh, how the photosystems were really performing. But we can say that uh, with the increase, we can say that uh, the, the plants were, were healthy under drought stress and the photosynthesis uh, was uh, occurring well. But if we want to really see what, um, if we want to really see how the photosystems were really performing or and other effects, then we have to move on to look at PI absorbance because it's more sensitive to abiotic stress and PI total. Okay, now I totally um, agree with you. The um, the PI total and the PI this are um, uh, are more sensitive than the AB over FM parameter. Uh, maybe I could just maybe add something um, uh, to this question. Um, normally, if you find a decline in AB over FM, that will indicate um, damage to photosystem 2, and that also indicates that your plant is under uh, photooxidation st um, stress. So basically, decline in AB over FM means that your plant is under severe stress. Okay, but yes, uh, yes. to pick up mild um, stress before damage to photosystem two, PI apps and your PI total uh, is a more re re reliable parameter. All right. Yes, yes. Uh, yes. Good. yes, yeah, um, yes. Thank you so yeah. much. Okay, yeah, yeah. Um, any other questions from our participants? All right. Um, if not, we can conclude. Um, this presentation, maybe just one announcement. Um, it looks like the photo competition has been reactivated. So if there are participants that like to participate in the photo competition, please upload your uh, uh, photos to the um, website and please do that before tomorrow. Okay, I can't see a time over here. I'll just quickly check, but um, yeah, if you have, have photos to upload for the photo competition, do it as soon as possible. All right, um, then we can conclude. And according to my program, we are now on a break until half past four.